<laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I'm, and thank you very much to the product school. Uh, I'm very excited to talk uh, to you guys today. Um, I get to talk about enterprise analytics, which is like one of my nerdy passions. Um, so I, it's very rare that I actually get to talk about this and people uh, don't shut me up very quickly. Um, but at any rate, my name is Gordon Silvera. Um, I am a data scientist at Spotify, and specifically, um, I guess uh, when I ask people or when people ask me what I do with Spotify, I just tell them that I analyze stuff um, because I think that kind of most comprehensively but succinctly uh, answers like what I actually do. Um, but very, more specifically, um, I work on a team called Data SWAT, and we are uh, basically in charge of providing support to a number of the highest priority projects within our company. Um, for those of you that know um, a bit about Spotify and the way that we operate our business, uh, we have a system called Bets, um, and these are basically the top 10 or so highest priority um, projects within the company. They last anywhere between, I'd say, probably three months and a year, um, but of course uh, you need data to help um, drive a lot of the decisions that occur within these bets. Um, so I basically work on an internal consulting team that is thrown on these various bets um, to do different types of analysis, um, which has been a great opportunity because you get to see a breadth of the company, you get to see um, a variety of analysis, etc. cetera. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you uh, at the end um, about a lot of the stuff that Spotify does. I think it's very exciting. I left it at the end so you guys don't leave beforehand. Um, but before that, I'm really going to talk a lot about analytics generally um, and kind of why I think that analytics is incredibly important in organizations or just whatever you do. Um, before we go into the kind of technical details, um, I want to discuss who I am, where I'm coming from, um, and I also want to discuss kind of uh, where we are as data professionals or people within the data industry where we are. Um, because I think this is, right now, is a very important time like within the life cycle of big data. In order to illustrate kind of where I'm from, um, I'm going to use the Google Trends chart. And I have three lines up here on um, data analysis in the blue, big data in green, and data science uh, in yellow. And actually, the x-axis, the range of the x-axis is the duration of my tenure, um, like, like overall the career tenure. And these are the various places that I've worked. And I'm going to talk through um, kind of briefly some of the places that I've worked because I think that I have a bit of a kind of different background than a lot of traditional data scientists, especially I think nowadays a lot of data scientists are coming through data science schools or coming through master's programs, et cetera, and come into it. Um, I kind of had a unique uh, data upbringing, if you will, um, and I think that kind of uh, impacts the way that I think about these things. And I think, secondly, um, I've had the opportunity to work with some very data-driven companies. I've had the opportunity to work for some incredible um, like visionaries in data. So I kind of want to speak to some of these individuals and these companies as well, um, because I think that is really kind of as you grow in analytics, having the opportunity to work with um, like great people who really understand this stuff or companies that really understand this stuff is incredibly valuable. So I couldn't really sit here and speak about data if I weren't actually to mention um, some of the people that helped me get here. Oh, wait, I haven't talked about them yet. <laughs> um, so I started out my career, my, my corporate career at Caesars Entertainment um, out in Las Vegas. And I was actually not, so for context, Caesars Entertainment, for those of you that don't know, um, previously Harris Entertainment, they were um, very much pioneers in CRM analytics um, and gaming. And there's a guy, Gary Loveman, who, uh, it is worth researching at some time if you have extra time. But he was a CEO at Caesars who really implemented their loyalty program, a lot of the CRM analytics that they do, et cetera. Um, so my job there was actually not analytical. I was a strategist. Um, and specifically, I was in charge of pricing hotel rooms. Um, so a few fun facts about that experience. One, um, two properties that I managed were actually one of the top 20 largest hotels um, in the world. Uh, another fun fact is that one of my properties, the first property that I managed, Imperial Palace, uh, was ranked one of the top 10 ugliest hotels in the world. Um, so basically, I started out my career selling $19 midweek rooms at a hotel with like super dingy carpets, and like, it was uh, at first a little bit disappointing. But what this experience taught me is I was able to make a lot of decisions every single day. Like I was charged. Deciding prices, every time you decide a price, you're making a decision. 
And we worked with an incredible analytics team, business intelligence team. So moreover, I learned how to use data to inform my business decisions. And the fact that I was pretty, uh, I was pretty green at this point in my career, um, and I didn't have a lot of revenue management experience, which is basically the practice of optimizing hotel room rates, et cetera. Um, so because of that, I was highly reliant on our data team. Yeah, you guys can come on in. Uh, and also, like, feel free to find a place to sit if you guys want. Um, so yeah, I, I was uh, managing these uh, rooms, especially at first, I was, I was very reliant on using the data, but as I started to better understand the data, I better started to better understand my properties and how I could price rooms. Um, and then after some initial successes at Imperial Palace, I moved on to pricing rooms at Planet Hollywood and, uh-oh. Sorry, you guys. Oh, it's back up, awesome. Okay, um, I'll flick it every now and then. Uh, yeah, I started working at Planet Hollywood and just my, my enthusiasm for understanding data and how it can improve my decisions just grew and grew and grew. Um, in fact, it got to the point where our business intelligence uh, manager said, Gordon, if you're gonna continue asking all these questions about data and like ask us for requests, you're gonna have to figure out how to do it yourself, which is a very important uh, part of my career. Um, so I said, all right, teach me how to do it or like show me what I need to know. And that's actually when I started getting into SQL, started dabbling in BBA. I started learning how to pull information very um, seamlessly and be able to automate a lot of the aspects of my job. And I actually ended up finding that that was more interesting than the hotel industry or pricing hotels or Las Vegas or gaming itself. Um, but I didn't have the necessary skill set to really um, make this my career at this point. So I started working at this company, Dunhumby. They are uh, a little known company, I think, in the US, but they were, uh, in my opinion, pioneers in CRM analytics and retail. And specifically, they actually partnered, one of their, um, well, their first large, very large client was Tesco grocery stores out in UK. And this was actually started by a couple um, from London, uh, Edwina, Edwina um, Dunn and Clive Humby, hence the name. Um, and they not only helped uh, Tesco launched their loyalty program, which, well, yeah, their loyalty program. Um, they also helped launch a very comprehensive analytical infrastructure underneath that. And this um, analytical infrastructure helped guide a lot of their one-to-one -one marketing, a lot of their merchandising optimization, their pricing optimization. It really covered a large uh, kind of uh, landscape in the way that Tesco operated their business. From there, they came to the U.S., um, started working with Kroger grocery stores. Um, of course, we don't have Kroger grocery stores in the Northeast, um, but for those of you that don't know or have never been there, they're the second largest grocery store in the U.S., uh, except for, of course, uh, Walmart. Who knows, maybe soon it'll be Amazon. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, really when I was working there, of course, so one of the things was we had full access to Kroger's um, data, and we had it at a, uh, a individually identifiable level, so we had every user ID and everything that they bought at Kroger, basically, um, which was pretty substantial data. Um, I think you could qualify that as big data. And a lot of the work that I did was either doing various t forms of analysis to help um, inform the consumer packaged good companies uh, who, are our, who were our clients, um, or eventually I moved over to the Kroger side of the business, helped Kroger um, with various things such as pricing optimization, um, building promotional tools, et cetera, to help them better understand their business. From there, came to New York, um, started working at Digitas, worked on their advanced analytics team. Um, from there, for, the, for those of you that know FanDuel, I worked at like one of the more infamous uh, startups in a kind of recent history of uh, infamous startups, I'd say. Um, I don't know, Here, show of hands, like who's heard of FanDuel? Okay, not, not a lot, so I won't go into it too, too much detail. It's basically, a uh, daily fantasy sports company. We'll keep it at that. And then most recently, um, started working at Spotify again. I've been there around nine months. Um, and I won't discuss a lot of the stuff that I'm doing there because I think we'll go into that in a bit more detail later. But I think one of the important things for context about Spotify is that um, I think they've been in business about 10 years now. I should probably know that more specifically. But about two years ago, um, there's a company called Seed Scientific, which is a consulting, analytical consulting company um, run by a guy named Adam Bly. Spotify acquired Seed Scientific 
um, brought them in. They're now the central analytics um, department within Spotify. And he's really the one that's driving a lot of the analytical vision at the company. Um, this guy, uh, sorry, uh, once again. All right. Sorry, guys, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. Yeah, I and mean, I'll just have to move this every now, every few minutes. Um, yeah, so he dri- he's been driving a lot of the analytical strategy, and it's been an awesome experience co- going there to be um, part of that vision because I think Spotify is at a very interesting point right now where they are, they definitely have the vision to become a best in class analytical company, um, kind of such as Google, Facebook, et cetera. And I definitely think that they'll get there. I think they have incredible people and they have this vision. Um, and I'm, I feel very fortunate to be um, there now, especially on the team that I'm on within Data Mission, because um, I'm one of the people that is responsible for kind of getting us to that point. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how do companies um, get to that point? How do you become best in class across your uh, entire organization? So before going, uh, or really just take a step back before going again into the technical details, I want to discuss big data and the trend of big data because I think this is very important and it's a little bit concerning for me as a data professional. So you'll notice around 2015, um, Google Trends basically stalled the big data according to Google, sorry, Google Trends has basically started to stall. Um, and when I saw this chart, it kind of uh, made me like, think of this, which is uh, Gartner, for those of you who know that uh, Gartner, it is their emerging technologies um, kind of uh, technology life cycle or the hype cycle. And to me, this resembles the peak of inflated expectations. So we're just going to kind of walk through an exercise here to kind of test this hypothesis, basically. And so that's so the first point is this Google Trends, which I actually think is kind of a weak trend. I don't really know that much about uh, Google Trends. Uh, so you could argue one way or the other. But secondly, we see a lot of academic articles or business-oriented articles from very uh, many top scholars discussing uh, or really questioning the value of data. Um, so in fact, uh, Chris Brom, who's the head of advanced analytics at Bain, mentions that only 4% of companies are able to fully capture um, the value of big data. Now, granted, I think as a consultant, he's probably just opening himself up or opening up shop for the other 96% of businesses, uh, as consultants do. Um, but I do think that this kind of 4% number is not um, unrealistic. I, th- I, th- I don't think that's like an overly conservative uh, estimate. And then, of course, you have a number of other uh, articles that mention this as well. Also, note, if you guys get access to this, art- uh, to this deck, if you click the images here, it should go into the actual article so you can do some initial reading and stuff. Um, and then the third point here is from Gartner itself. Uh, I guess this is a bit of a trump card, but yeah. So Gartner, this is their 2016 hype cycle for big data. And one of the things that you'll notice is a number of the kind of principal applications of big data are actually at the top of the hype cycle. So you have things like predictive analytics, Python, um, data lakes, Spark, predictive analytics, machine learning. Gardner is saying that all of these things are at the top of the hype cycle. Um, So again, as data professionals, um, I I think, or just anybody that uses data within business, um, I think this should be a bit of a yellow flag. Um, And basically, the way that uh, I think about data, and this is like something that's very essential to the way I think about data, the way that we break out of this hype cycle, and I think the way that we will ultimately be able to make an analytics very valuable, uh, especially big data analytics, uh, very valuable for companies on an ongoing basis, is by thinking about this. And I'd honestly say, uh, of all this presentation, if you take away anything, I would take this away. You have to connect data to underlying business value, and that should be ideally quantifiable business value. Um, We'll go into this a little bit more, um, but I think this is a very important concept. So just uh, kind of in summary, we're at the peak of uh, inflated expectations. We should but break beyond the big data hype, and the way that we can do that is by connecting uh, data to its underlying value. So why do companies need enterprise analytics? 
Um, I think before actually going into the concept, or sorry, discussing what, the why, we should define what I consider enterprise analytics. So when I think about enterprise analytics, I consider it basically when an analytical organization in a business is considered as important as any other major function within that company. So be it marketing, finance, operations, etc. And the way that we consider it kind of important is through uh, the financing or the investment that you get, the types of people that you're bringing in, um, the prioritization of the hiring, and also um, executive level support. I think these are very important. So beyond the business piece, and this is kind of where I, uh, I, I get into more of kind of more existentially or philo philosophically kind of why I believe in uh, analytics. Um, and th this is supposed to represent basically a, a tangent that I'm going to take you guys on for a minute, so just bear with me. Um, so I, I think about analytics, I think analytics itself is uh, more than just crunching numbers or information. Um, I think it is very critical to being successful at most anything uh, that is highly competitive or highly challenging. Um, so we're going to go on this journey of logic. You guys can disagree with me or not afterwards, but let's do it. And to kind of start it off, um, there's somebody else who I have a lot of respect for, who I'm very fond of, um, who can really explain the crux of this um, better than I certainly could. So uh, I'll, let the, I'll let him do this. Hopefully this works. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from you. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's just a game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. <laughs> On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. <laughs> So sorry for the bro session there for a second. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a caveat, I guess. Like, I'm not much of a football guy. Um, I, I was formerly, I, I love rugby, but I was going to put something with rugby up there, and I figured that everybody would get lost in translation, and the whole conversation would fall flat from there. So I stuck with football, um, keep it sufficiently Americanized. Um, but yeah, so football is a game of inches, life's a game of inches, and I really believe that business is a game of inches. Um, and again, like coming from competitive sports, doing uh, business for a while now, um, I definitely think of uh, business and sports and really just anything that you do competitively as uh, quite synony synonymous, or not synonymous, but uh, quite similar in many ways. Um, and specifically in business, if you want to be successful in business, Apologies for being too preachy here, but uh, yeah, let's just go with it. Um, I think to be really successful in business, you have to win in the margin. So this is really the concept that um, Al Pacino or his character is talking about here, winning at the inches. You have to really do the small things and execute the small things well. So we're going to kind of discuss this concept of winning at the margin uh, for a moment. So when I, just, when I think of winning at the margin, like what does that actually mean? Uh, this is kind of how I'm defining it. So consistently executing the profit generating processes of the business better than all uh, competitors. Of course, you can apply this to sports, you can apply this to pretty much anything. Um, and it's not only me uh, that thinks this, probably not too many would be interested if I'm, or I'm not the only one that thinks this or embodies this. Um, these are business people that um, I am kind, of, kind of follow, uh, I guess. Um, but they really embody this ideal as well. So Jeff Bezos, um, I, I think it's pretty inarguable that 
uh, Amazon, well, Jeff Bezos individually is a highly competitive individual. Um, the, the culture there is very competitive. And um, they are really obsessed about optimizing market share and cash flow. Um, and yeah, we'll go into that. Secondly, um, he, she shows this also kind of, if you, if you think about increasing your revenue as an offensive, he thinks about this defensively as well through the principle of frugality. Um, so for those of you that know, um, at Amazon, frugality is one of their principles, and they really live it. Um, if you have any friends that have, like, go traveling with them, it's, it's evidently not super fun to travel with uh, Amazon <laughs> when you're working for Amazon. Um, Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater, um, I think this guy is an amazing, like, a brilliant dude. Um, but anyway, so here in the quote, he's talking about the economic machine, which, again, um, I actually sent a link at the end of the deck. Um, I would suggest that you YouTube the economic machine. But here I'm actually not really thinking about the economic machine in relation to winning at the margin. Um, the reason that I bring up Ray Dalio is because he has this concept of machines generally. And specifically in his uh, book called Principles, which is really, the life, uh, really more about life principles and how you achieve things that you want in your life, um, he talks about this concept of a machine which is really, uh, at the end of the day, very simplistically, you have like this machine and you have where you want to go. And you take an action that will hopefully get to you to where you want to go, and that causes a result. Um, you take that result, you learn from it, and you take another action um, that is kind of based off of that initial learning, and you progress from there. Based off of this very, um, I mean, granted, I am oversimplifying this concept, but based basically off of that concept that he discusses, damn it, um, he was able to uh, build the largest hedge fund in the world and arguably one of the most hedge fund, uh, successful hedge funds in the world. Um, but yeah, it, I, I think you guys should, if you ever have time, check him out. Um, very humble guy and really brilliant guy. So these quotes over here, um, I actually don't think are super relevant to winning at the margin, but I, I like these guys, so I put them in. The last one I think is actually most relevant um, to what I'm talking about with winning at the margin. So Sam Walton says, you can make a lot of mistakes and can still recover if you have an efficient operation. Um, or you can be brilliant and can still go out of business if you're too inefficient. Um, so, so far we've talked about this concept of winning at the margin. We've talked about kind of outside of the business context from a more um, like visceral perspective why, why we I uh, think that winning at the margin is important, but we haven't talked about like how do you actually do this. And um, here are kind of what I think are the lowest common, not, lowest common denominators of kind of what is required to win at the margin. Um, and I'll let you uh, read these things. I think they're pretty self-explanatory, but I think there's a couple things here that are uh, worth noting. Um, one is that this applies to really anything um, that you want to do in life, business, sports, etc. And then secondly, um, when I think about business, just uh, more generally, kind of as a data strategist, um, I, I break up business into three sections. And I think just when you actually do analysis, it helps you kind of understand uh, business at a very high level. Um, and the way that I break it out is strategy, operations, and analytics. Um, and then where strategy could be anything from marketing, um, your executive team, et cetera. Um, operations are the people that are actually executing whatever uh, is necessary to have the business run. And analytics are the nerds that analyze stuff. Um, so within this, and you can kind of see how this ties into uh, the concept of winning, or sorry, this framework, because culture of discipline, I would argue, is more aligned to strategy. Uh, efficient operation is more aligned to operations, of course, how well you can actually execute. Um, and then iterative improvement is really, in my opinion, um, aligned with analytics. Because so you think about analytics more fundamentally or improve, uh, iterative improvement, it, it requires two things at a very basic level. It requires you to know how well you're doing um, relative to where you've been in the past, where you, uh, how you are doing relative to competitors, etc. And it requires you to know um, how to get better. And I would argue um, that analytics are, within a business context, are quite critical for both of these things. Um, so I'd say, yeah, analytics is the best path to iterative improvement, in my opinion. So just again, in summary, business is a game of inches, one of the margin. Um, it requires discipline, effective execution, and um, iterative improvement. And then analytics is the best way to make this improvement. 
So how do companies um, build enterprise analytics? Finally getting closer to the good content, so thank you guys for bearing with me so far. Um, before actually going into the enterprise analytics, I want to think about this concept. How do we quantify the value of analytics? Because again, based off of all of these um, articles that we were mentioning previously, a lot of people are starting to question the value of big data, question the value of data science, et cetera. So I think it's very important to be able to quantify the value that we as a profession are bringing to companies. Of course, um, for those of you that do analysis, in uh, kind of optimization or user targeting, et cetera, it's actually quite a bit easier um, because you can A-B test these things. If you're predicting when users are going to churn, you can build a predictive model against it. You can split the groups into two. You can drop, uh, predict, you can predict one group and then target them um, or you can add a particular uh, propensity to churn. The other one is just completely untargeted and you can A-B test it. Um, when it's actually, and I consider that kind of the, anything related to generally optimization or t user targeting, et cetera, I think of that as like operational analytics. So analytics where you're not really gleaning information off of the analysis you're doing, you're improving processes that are, and it's more kind of black box streamlined uh, work that you're doing. The other side of that is strategic analytics. Um, so you're actually creating insights that people will kind of take in this information and hopefully change uh, their decisions. I'm just going to move this around a little bit so we don't freeze up. Um, change their decisions off of that. Um, so an effort to quantify this, I think the strategic side is actually a bit more difficult. It was definitely more difficult to actually quantify. But let's say that just for the sake of this practice, um, we want to actually quantify what an insight is. I think that this is a very uh, simple definition that you can use. So an insight is an information point that guides a strategic, or a strategic decision. Of course, that is in reality a bit difficult to do. Like let's say every time, or across your an entire analytical community, every time somebody sees a PowerPoint presentation and says, hey, you know something, that's interesting. I'm going to do this differently. Or every time that somebody um, on a line of production workers sees a data point come up uh, throughout their process and says, hey, no, you know something, I think we need to lower the capacity on this machine because of this. Like, those are all insights, but those are very difficult to tag and practice, of course. But if we think about this from a conceptual perspective, I think it allows us to kind of put this into a more quantitative framework or a kind of an economic framework. Um, and the way that I think about this is, uh, or one of the frameworks that you can use is economies of scale. So I think economies of scale are a very important concept within enterprise analytics because um, for those of you that like worked in startups, et cetera, you generally start small in analytics. You have just a, a couple business intelligence people, data scientists, analysts, et cetera. But this really limits you. And I guess uh, before going into this, I should discuss this chart. What this chart is, uh, the, the y-axis is a little bit flawed, but what I'm looking at here is the number of insights from the way that we define this, the number of insights per analyst per period of time. So finally, while you guys were here, um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. I think we're doing all right. Um, so how do we build uh, enterprise analytics at Spotify? Again, um, coming into the organization, it, it was very gratifying for me to see that these guys are like really thinking about um, being pioneers in analytics and like where they're trying to go. I think the vision um, that the company has in, in regard to data is incredibly impressive and comprehensive and deep. Um, and also, a lot of the tools that they're building right now, I, I think, are very impressive and interesting and make my job a lot easier. Um, before going into some of the stuff that we do, I think for just general context, um, we use what they call a um, center of excellence model. And this is actually a concept that was, I don't know, it's, it's basically an org, it's an org model. Um, you can have embedded analytics teams, you can have uh, a centralized analytics team. This is kind of more of a hub and spoke model where we have data mission um, at the center of everything and we almost act a little bit in uh, consultative in manner. Um, we can go into that a little bit later, but yeah. And then we basically help support these embedded teams 
within the actual functions. So of course, this is not a comprehensive of everything, of all the various teams in Spotify, but we have a marketing team. And then within the marketing team, we have a marketing sciences team. We have content insights that focuses on um, better understanding our artists and the way that users engage with our artists. We have product insights that looks at, that kind of more deeply looks at our actual products um, and how those perform, et cetera. And then you have data mission that um, essentially generates a lot of data. They develop best practices, processes, um, tools to use. Um, they hire some people like me to, to throw around the business, et cetera. Um, so the data mission is not really um, focused on any functional objective per se, but just generally a how, a how can we move the company forward in regard to analytics. Um, so these are uh, keys to excellence. I don't think that's like the best title. Um, but I think this slide and then this next slide, we'll kind of discuss these briefly. Um, I think these are the next two most important slides uh, in this deck. Um, even though they don't have a lot of context, with these two slides, like this is um, a frame, frameworks that I like to use and call like PIPs. Um, and then this is uh, analytics maturity pyramid. I think though these two can give you a very good conceptual understanding of um, how to approach analytics in an organization. Um, for those of you that know um, Tim Ferriss, uh, author of Four Hour Work Week, um, I was watching a TED talk that he had recently, um, and he was discussing how he became a world class tango dancer in a matter of months. And he went around, uh, met with a bunch of tango dancers, uh, and asked them, like, how, how are you so good at what you do? And they told them a bunch of information. He processed all this information. And one of the high-level things that he found is there's two categories of, in, of um, knowledge that they were transferring to him. One was explicit. One was implicit. So the explicit was like kind of the traditional um, how do you tango, like what are the particular steps, what are the kind of the, the X's and O's, or just like kind of what I call commoditized information about how to tango dance. The other side is an implicit. These are things that the tango dancers don't actually explain, but all of them do. Evidently, like long strides. I'm, I'm a terrible tango dancer. Um, but like long strides, evidently, um, certain swooping movements. And all these guys did it, or uh, ladies as well, um, but they did not actually discuss it. And I think I've been talking a lot, so does, maybe we'll do like one question. Um, I don't know, does anyone have any questions? All right, if not, think about, think about them a little bit. Continue listening, but also think about it in the back of your mind. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I, th I think, probably the, the most in interesting part of this uh, presentation, the, the stuff that we actually do. And again, what, really what we're doing here is taking these uh, two frameworks, um, kind of blending them together, and then taking a bunch of stuff that Spotify does and like sticking them on that shelf, basically, um, if you can visualize that. Um, so... One of the things here, uh, to the lower right-hand side, this is a screenshot of BigQuery. BigQuery is the database that we use. Um, it, it's a fairly uh, new form of technology. And really, um, the, the ability to process information at an increasingly uh, fast rate is incredibly important in big data analytics, data science, et cetera. So this is, this is a great idea. Um, and I think for some additional context, there's actually, again, an article in the appendix. Let's see if we... Yes, it's a lot. Okay. Um, there's an article in the appendix about this um, from Harvard Business uh, Review. It's called, uh, Does Your Data Have a Strategy? So in this article, uh, they talk about single sources of truth and multiple versions of truth. So the single sources of truth are basically what your most important data, things that flow through to your um, financials, things that are shown across a company for company-wide metrics. These things have to be highly accurate. Um, so these are your single sources of truth. So at Spotify, we have teams that are dedicated to generating single sources of truth. It's called business critical data, and they have SLOs that are very tight around it. They have a, a great team that generates this incredible data. On the other hand, you have multiple versions of data. This is more um, kind of exploratory work. So again, we have the squad model, and even within product insights, you're going to have a bunch of analysts distributed a bunch of, across a bunch of different squads. And they're going to generate uh, data. So for instance, on search, every time that you search for an artist or a song on Spotify, we retrieve uh, that data. The search team, so that data is very important to the search team. 
maybe less so to a lot of other teams. Um, so that's where the multiple versions of truth come in. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate. I would imagine with search data, if uh, we could probably get decent um, insights off of 80 to 90% accuracy. And this is like uh, Capital One has this model. Um, I know like uh, at least certain parts of the Oregon Google um, have this model. Uh, this is becoming, especially in tech, because you oper tech companies generally operate with a squad model. Um, because of that, this multiple version of truth is, is super important. Is that where innovation is happening? Is there the sandbox where the are like, discovering the that data? So I wouldn't say it was a sandbox per se. I would say that it's the phase after that. Um, so uh, sandbox probably should not be, um, that data probably should not be explored out of the team that's actually building it because um, it's still very much in the um, preliminary uh, experimental phase. So there might be m kind of more substantial, like anything, let's say, below an 80% accuracy level is a bit concerning. Um, but you're, you're still working with this data. I think once you get past that sandbox phase when you can actually productionize it, like a data scientist has time to productionize it, QA it, ensure that it's accurate, then you can kind of move it into that MBOT model. And more specifically, how we do this in Spotify, um, a lot of times you'll see like within BigQuery, you'll have a folder um, or data set that has like underscore dev. You know, unless you're on that team that's doing some of that dev work or the development work, don't touch it because you don't know how reliable it is. But then once we start actually producing on an ongoing basis, we have documentation, we have process, we have QA, etc. It's still going to be within that MBOT and we have, yeah, so we still have a lot of uh, a good level of reliability on that data, but it's still in the MBOT model because we don't have these very stringent SLAs. We don't have teams fully dedicated to that data, etc. In other words, pre-production data. Sorry? Uh, pre-production. Uh, yeah, I would say pre-production could be a gray area, let's say. Um, I, I think that it's productionalized. So this is a picture of uh, ABBA our A-B testing system, also the name uh, of an awesome Swedish band, if you guys don't know. Um, and then we have, so a, uh, this is kind of has to coordinate across engineers who actually do our instrumentation on particular aspects of the A-B test. Um, our product owners and strategic people look at this to find uh, performance. You get um, uh, T-tests and significance testing, etc. cetera. Similarly, uh, this is what we call System Z. This is a platform that runs and schedules all of our internal, um, like really all of our internal products. Um, I specifically use this uh, for something called BigQuery Runner, which basically allows you to schedule um, queries on an ongoing basis. Surprisingly, um, any engineers in here that want to kind of, I, I think this is a really good idea, just have a very simple, um, uh, have a very simple scheduling system that uh, connects into GitHub. If you could do that, you would make so many people's lives easier. Um, because I was working with another company that was trying to uh, set this kind of infrastructure up, and nothing really exists. Um, AWS is building out something, but yeah. At any rate, we have this very um, robust infrastructure that allows us to schedule any number of queries. It applies dependencies, so if you have to have run one query and then pull data off of that query and run another one afterwards, you can do all that. Um, so again, this is all about, and, and again, like. I should mention, the people that are building this are like beast engineers, back-end engineers, et cetera. Um, there's no way that I could do this, but it makes my job so much easier. I can be much more effective at what I do. So that's kind of going back to that um, economies of scale. Things like this are really where it plays out. Um, people and stuff, uh, I guess one thing I should mention is this is kind of interesting and distinct from some of the places that I've uh, worked previously. Spotify, I noticed this, um, they're, they're very uh, specific about certain aspects of their hiring, and one of the things that they really look for are T-shaped skill sets. Um, so this is somebody that has a lot of depth in one thing, but also has a lot of broad knowledge um, in a variety of other things. Um, it's funny, I was actually talking to this guy who is a product owner for this one uh, uh, aspect of the business, and I was talking to this guy, um, like really, really sharp dude. But oh, we we're having these conversations, and then he came in one day, and he's like, "Oh, we need to look at this piece of information." 
It's like, let me just pull up my terminal. It pulls up his uh, command line terminal, starts like querying this massive set of data using greps and stuff and command line interfaces. And I was like, holy shit, like how does a product owner actually know how to do all this stuff? So I was talking to one of my other friends. I was like, dude, this guy, um, this product owner is like a beast. He was using command line interfaces and stuff. He's crushing it. And he's like, oh no, he used to be an engineer for six years and he came over to the business side. I was like, oh, this is a really good business person for an engineer, you know? Um, but you have these people with like very um, wide skills, but also very deep skills. So my favorite uh, internal tool at Spotify, it's called Lexicon. It has every single analysis um, that data scientists have done. And it has a ton of metadata that you can um, index and search, et cetera. It's incredibly useful because every time that I go into analysis, and again, um, I'm in a kind of rare case where I don't have a lot of context generally um, on the projects that I'm going into because they basically just like throw me around the business on different stuff and say, figure it out. This is invaluable to me. Um, same thing, exploring data. We have 60,000 data sets, um, and we have, like here you'll see artists, all the primary uh, data sets related to artists, album, etc. So it just makes it uh, like 10, 100 times faster for me to find the data that I actually need to use. Um, yeah, it's awesome, and it looks pretty. Um, awesome, yeah. So. That, that is it. 